What's up guys, Leopold the Brave here at Crossover X for another beautiful episode of Scene Selection, and we have an interesting topic for you today. We all have our favorite games. Some of them are big AAA titles that come from our favorite console developers. Some are a bit smaller, but still very much get the attention they deserve. Sometimes we catch and ride the wave of a small but explosively popular indie title like Undertale or Among Us. And then there's games that don't really fit into any of those categories and don't feel like they'll ever get proper recognition. And those games are what we're showing love to this month. Now what are my picks? I grew up with the PlayStation 1, and with so many great titles on the system, there were plenty that were bound to be overlooked. I could say Croc, or that one Frogger game. But I want to go a bit more modern and talk about games that can still be saved. And hey, they're both multiplayer, so you can try them out with your friends and see if you like them. The first game I present to you is Paladins. Now truthfully, this game isn't that underrated. It actually has a pretty hefty player base. The main reason I'm presenting it and still think it's at least a little underrated enough to talk about more so has to do with its reputation. In case you haven't noticed, it looks very similar to another popular game. To be factual though, this and Overwatch were actually being developed around the same time, so it's kinda impossible for them to rip each other off. Plus I just find that Paladins actually has more to offer, mainly with the ability to customize your loadout. You can choose a set of cards that can enhance or change your weapons, and even mid-match gets interesting, as throughout the game, you can upgrade your own physical personal stats. It adds an extra layer of depth to the combat as you have to carefully choose what you want to upgrade depending on how well your team is doing. I just find Paladins overall to be way more engaging, and uh, just between us, aside from Widowmaker, Paladins has the better girls. <laughs> Anyways, what's my other game? Well, we're gonna get into some spooky territory with Dead by Daylight, a horrifically unbalanced but still incredibly fun multiplayer 4 vs 1 horror game. The goal of the game is simple. You and your teammates must repair five different generators scattered throughout the map so you can open a gate and escape wherever you're trapped in before the killer catches and sacrifices you. There's loads of survivors, loads of killers, loads of maps you can go to, so many customization options, perk setups, items to help you improve your game. Dead by Daylight is just packed to make sure each match you're in is completely different from the last. And the best part is, it's genuinely scary. Now every now and then I'm sure you'll have a sweaty teammate that knows the game way too well for their own good and will just loop and cheese the killer the entire game, but most of the time you'll need to be stealthy, sneaky, and you'll need to smartly strategize because it's intensely fun. Now Dead by Daylight has actually been picking up quite a bit of steam lately thanks to the addition of Pyramid Head from Silent Hill as one of the killers, but considering the game is almost 5 years old at this point, it's a little late don't you think? So be sure to check these games out. Rhythm freaking heaven. Where do I begin with this series? Many may know it from Smash speculation when people talked about the chorus kits possibly being playable in Smash Wii and 3DS, and some may have seen the many memes based on the ringside minigame or remix temp from Rhythm Heaven Fever. Yet when it comes to the actual games themselves, they seem to go under the radar for many casual gaming fans. For those unaware, the Rhythm Heaven series is a set of rhythm games developed by the same folks who created the WarioWare series of games that saw its first release with the Japan exclusive Rhythm Tengoku for the Game Boy Advance in 2006, which was then followed up by a worldwide release of Rhythm Heaven on the DS in 2008, along with Rhythm Heaven Fever on the Wii, and lastly Rhythm Heaven Mega Mix on the 3DS in 2011 and 2015 respectively. Now unlike many other rhythm games that have one consistent playstyle throughout and sometimes a lot of different buttons to use, Rhythm Heaven is actually a collection of rhythm based mini games that only need a couple buttons to play with many games only needing just one button to play, making it a game that's very easy to pick up and play, but also a game that requires great timing and skill to master. These kinds of games can have you do stuff like keeping a rally going with a consistent beat, hitting the button on the right cue, copying the last set of beats you heard exactly, and many more like that. 
and of course, after completing a set of games, you are also given a challenge of completing a remix, which combines all the games you previously played into one song. Of course, these can range from, hey, this song's pretty catchy and fun to play, to, oh god, why is it speeding up, why is it speeding up, oh my god, please stop speeding up, oh my god, ah! On top of its simple gameplay, the visual style of this game just oozes charm. It's not often you see a game primarily have a flat 2D style like this, especially nowadays with everything being 3D and all that. Of course, a good rhythm game has to have a good selection of songs, and of course, Rhythm Habit has a killer soundtrack to it. From the upbeat and catchy Lockstep and Air Rally, to the slow and calming sounds of Double Day and Glee Club, to the almost celebratory dreams of our generation, and many more. As a whole, Rhythm Heaven is just such a fun series that's seriously worth playing if you ever get the chance. If you want my recommendation on where to start, definitely pick up Mega Mix on the 3DS's eShop since the game is meant to be the best up collection of minigames that showed up throughout the series on top of being jam-packed with enough content for its price. It's also one of the easier and cheaper games to track down since, yeah, unless you still have a Wii U, good luck tracking down a copy of Rhythm Heaven Fever on the Wii that isn't 100 bucks or more. Overall, I just hope that maybe someday good old Rhythm Heaven will be up there amongst Nintendo's greatest series. Now, I know what you're thinking. ARMS is underrated. But it's one of Nintendo's newest original IPs. It got added to Smash, and Twintel still gets looted a lot. How could this game possibly be underrated? Well, simply because I think a lot of people take it for granted, especially Nintendo themselves. Obviously, the game is far from perfect, and there have been a lot of valid criticisms about it that I actually agree with. Most notably, not having a lot of content and being too pricey because of that. Plus, I totally understand that the gameplay isn't going to be for everyone here. It does take a bit of getting used to, and even then it can be kind of jank at points. But speaking from my own experiences with ARMS, I do think it's a fun, fresh, and unique take on the fighting game genre. Just like other fighting games, it's still a game that keeps you on your toes and forces you to sink in the heat of the moment, but does so in a way that's both simple and complex, much like Nintendo's other big fighting series. And I feel like it doesn't really get talked about as much as it deserves to. A lot of people just kind of disregard it as another Nintendo trying to justify the motion controls, and obviously I can't say that's not part of the reason why it exists. But you can tell that there was still a lot of effort and care that went into this game beyond that. The character designs are pretty on point and very memorable, to the point where some of them have even gone on to be iconic Nintendo characters to people that never even played the game. It's also got some surprisingly in-depth lore that you really have to dig in to get to, which likely would have been expanded upon in a graphic novel if that didn't get stuck in development limbo. And, oh yeah, have I mentioned the music yet? Because every single music track in this game slaps hard. Thanks to Min Min being added to Smash, ARMS did get a little bit more recognition for a while, but obviously it didn't last very long. And ARMS is still pretty far from being the next Mario or Zelda. Not that I'm saying it needs to be or anything like that. But just to reiterate, I do think ARMS is a game that has a lot about it to appreciate, that a lot of people just don't see in it for whatever reason. But it's also because of these reasons that ARMS is probably the big Switch game that I most want a sequel for. Yeah, even more than Breath of the Wild 2 or a potential Super Mario Odyssey sequel, despite that being my outright favorite Switch game. Although getting both would be pretty nice. One idea I do have for an ARMS sequel, though, just make it an outright crossover with Punch-Out. Just say it takes place in a weird future version of it, and have characters from that game be guest stars. Very unlikely to happen, but just thought I might as well throw that idea out there. Well, that's about everything I have to say for this section, and boy are my arms tired! Wait, that made no sense. Shit. This is Deadly Rooms of Death, or Jot for short. A neat indie PC game that initially came out in 1996 to an audience of However, as niche as this game is, it still has a very dedicated community. And because of that, the developers were able to do a total of 5 games, some remakes, and a level builder which has led to tons of free levels to play for endless content. So what the hell is this game about? Mechanically, Drot works as a top-down puzzle game where you control Pethro, an exterminator whose objective is to kill everything in the room and manage to live alive. And because of the elements and the different mechanics the game has, it steadily becomes an incredible challenge. 
The game works in turns, as in, you move, then everything else in the room moves. And like that you have to figure out every move you do to find the solution to each room in the game. Now, when this game was first released, it was just that. A very amateur game with very unique mechanics and a lot of difficulty. But with time and with the sequels, they slowly fleshed out the story of the game more and more. Oh, this game has story? Quite a story, in fact. But sadly, it doesn't go much in depth until the third game, The City Beneath. The gist of the story is that Bithro, our protagonist, is tasked to clean the king's dungeons of all the monsters and infestations, and in his contract he is specified to kill absolutely everything he finds. However, when he goes in, they tell him that he would have to clean 9 floors. Instead, he finds not 10, not 15, but 25 levels full of monsters, and the lower he goes he starts to realize he's no longer in the dungeons, but rather approaching an underground city which by the way has a lot of complex socio-political systems and that's where the story becomes very complex very quickly. I'm here for a name. Number please. I don't have a number. No number? I'm <laughs> quite sorry. You'll have to get in the back of the line. It's still all very interesting and fun though, and it has one of the most engaging stories I've seen in a video game. It's also the hardest game I've ever played. No really, I discovered this game when I was like, what, four? And just because of that I got really used to it, but to be honest, this game is not very accessible. Mostly because of the insane difficulty, bizarre art style, and not so great voice acting. Audio bargain? Gosh, my money? You know there's no goblin money. <laughs> Still, if you enjoy puzzle games and want to check out some neat stories and characters, it's something that is worth checking out. It also has some banging music. For reference, the original 1996 game has been lost to time and it's almost impossible to find now. But as for the rest of the official games, you start with Architect's Edition or the remake King Dugan's Dungeon, then Journey to Red Hold, The City Beneath, a prequel called Gone Through on the Epic Blunder, and the epic finale The Second Sky, which is in my top 3 of favorite games of all time. You know what game is really good? Skullgirls. Chances are that by now you've heard of this indie fighter icon by the talented folks at Lab Zero Games. From its incredible art style to its slapping soundtrack to the fleshed out fighting game mechanics, you'd be hard pressed to find someone online who doesn't have at least one good thing to say about it. It might not be as big as other AAA fighting titans, but it has a dedicated following and even has thriving updates and content releases to this day. But did you know that there was another Lab Zero game whose ultimate fate wasn't quite so fortunate? Well, ladies and gentlemen, allow me to stick up for the game stuck in Skullgirl's shadow and spin you the unfortunate tale of Indivisible. The year is 2015, and in the humbly spooky month of October, Lab Zero launches an Indiegogo campaign for a new title that marries platformer mechanics to fighting game-esque combat and an RPG-like story. This was the start of Indivisible, which would eventually see a release four years later, in October of 2019. The game stars Ajna, a headstrong young girl from a remote forest village whose clash with a conqueror's army leads her down a path of self-discovery and ultimate sacrifice. I won't get too deep into spoiler territory because there are some legitimate twists and turns in the game's story that are worth seeing for yourself, but the story's only one piece of the really interesting puzzle here. Like I said before, Indivisible's core gameplay is some Metroidvania-like platforming around a large and varied overworld, beautifully brought to life by Lab Zero's signature graphics and art style. From the steampunk suburbia of the Iron Kingdom to the vibrant underground waterworks of Kanul, the world is simply gorgeous to look at while exploring and pursuing quests, and the amazing soundtrack by Hiroki Kikuta, famous for his work on the Mana series, sucks you into the game's world even more. But this is a Lab Zero game we're looking at here, so of course we have to talk about the combat, which seems simple at first, but is actually pretty inventive and fun to play around with. Each playable character that Ajna meets over the course of her journey has unique moves that can all be activated at any point during a fight, so there's a lot of room for experimentation with combos to keep your opponent from getting a turn off and racking up as much damage as possible. The combat system also has a unique emphasis on blocking, training you to learn the enemy's attack patterns so you can stay alive and fight back as effectively as possible. 
It's certainly more so just button mashing than specific inputs and technical combos like traditional fighting games. But the animations are so impressive and the voice acting is so on point that it's just fun to go to town on whatever poor enemy ends up getting in your way. And hey, speaking of characters you meet during the journey, let's talk about them, because there sure are a lot! There are 20 playable cast members in total, and as you get to know each of them over the course of the game, you're sure to end up with at least a few favorites. The writing for these characters and the overall story is pretty solid as a whole. Even Ajna, who starts the game off as a naive and immature adventurer who barely listens to the friends she has around her, ends up being redeemed and grows really well as a character going into the second half. Mainly thanks to a big sacrifice. Hashtag Ripdar. Despite all of these strengths and things I really liked about Indivisible, its initial launch was met with middling reviews and mixed reception overall, which was just the start of its troubles. Because if you were following the whole Lab Zero controversy as it was happening like I was, you kind of had a feeling of where things were going to end up for Indivisible's upcoming plans. And just like its fans feared, 505 Games, the people who hold the rights to the Indivisible IP, ended up pulling the plug on its future development after Lab Zero fell apart due to Mike Z's actions. No more DLC, no more guest characters, no more anything. There were even plans for it to get an animated adaptation on NBC's streaming platform, but in all likelihood, that's never going to see the light of day either now. Indivisible was a really unique game with so much potential and so many strengths in its corner, but it never really managed to obtain the same cult status that its better known predecessor enjoys. And unless 505 Games surprises us with new updates down the line, it probably never will. <laughs>